My name is Charles Hopkins. I'm the UNESCO chair at York University in Toronto, Canada. Um, but let me begin by thanking the College of Teacher Education there at Cebu Normal University for inviting me to speak and share some ideas at the seventh International Teacher Education Student Conference. Let me uh, put up my, um, my screen and then we can begin. I'm really intrigued um, by the theme uh, of making education sustainable in the new normal. Uh, when I received that, I thought, uh, <clears throat> I thought that I would put a bit of a twist on it. So my approach to the theme will be on bringing sustainability, the concept of sustainability into education systems in the next normal and hopefully in a way that sustainability will remain in education through all the following new normals that will be coming our way. So I've entitled it challenges and opportunities in the next normal, the role of education in a post COVID-19 era. Now, <clears throat> The reason I say that uh, the next normal is because realistically, there are so many issues that are out there beyond COVID, right? And if we think of it, once COVID is gone, things will be all right. However, the uh, World Economic uh, Forum each year sort of maps where the different crises are and as uh, seen by countries from all around the world. So in this chart, in the newest release that has just come out, if you look, you will see the axis of impact, so low impact, high impact if it happens, and across the horizontal axis is the likelihood, very low likelihood, very high likelihood. So, of course, we're interested what's up in this corner of high impact and, and great likelihood. So, largely what you find are environmental issues, climate change, biodiversity loss, extreme weather conditions, and so on. And, of course, the Philippines, that's, that is you. The number of typhoons that come roaring in and hit you. Um, it is absolutely amazing. On my trips there to Cebu in the past and uh, in other parts of the Philippines, it is, uh, it is amazing how often uh, you get hit and how low your ecological footprint really is that is creating that kind of change. So we have these risks that are out there and each risk comes with a web of interrelated facts and so on. So that if we take climate, uh, climate change and we want to look at what are the other aspects that would be involved, everything from uh, the natural disasters, the extreme weather and so on, the biodiversity loss, but you will see with climate action, you also have issues around water crisis, involuntary migration, where people are, are forced to move, uh, storm surges and so on, sometimes permanently, that people really do need to be uh, relocated because each storm surge is getting larger and uh, the, the region is un uninhabitable. And with that comes social instability and so on. So as I say, just because we think COVID is past, uh, no. We know there's a great long list of issues that are there. As we, in the future, we'll be coping with roughly 25% more people uh, and still trying to address poverty, trying to address uh, exclusion, uh, the uh, uh, employment, uh, indecent work and so on, health issues, etc. But what does this really mean then for the education sector? Those of you who are going on to be 
uh, become teachers. Well, let's look at a post-COVID and or during COVID and see what really has changed. Is it temporary or permanently in, in K-12 education? So first of all, we see suddenly what had with predicted for years that we needed to uh, move on to online teaching and learning, et cetera. Well, we now have experience in the, the possibilities, the limitations, and what really is needed if we are going to bring online teaching and learning in, into reality. Can this be entirely online? Should it be entirely online? etc. I'm of an age and I remember that when televisions were first brought into a classroom, the idea was we would no longer need teachers. We would just put television sets in front of the classroom and there would be this uh, super teacher who would teach to thousands at a, at a set time. Right? Totally unrealistic. But what are the others? The, the, the shift in responsibility to the learner. If the child is at home and, uh, and uh, education is being provided and there is no one there really uh, shepherding, uh, explaining, making sure that as the, as the uh, lesson e evolves that the person understands and so on, uh, I'll come back to this because it is a very important point, the awareness of mental health and so on. And then we get into the whole idea of assessment. Uh, what are we observing? You know, and, and how are we going to track? Is it the student that is doing it? Is it the parent that is doing it? And so on. Um, these are, are all in important issues let alone the idea of what is the, the world of work going to be and how are we preparing uh, students for the, uh, the world of work. But it, not all is, is, uh, is uh, lost. I think that what we are, are doing is that we're realizing that there are some opportunities. First of all, let's think of that list of issues that I brought up, the challenges. The challenges are also the opportunities of the future because these issues are not going away. Yeah? So they are going to be with us and the economy of the future will largely be built and influenced around these particular issues. So as educators, we need to be thinking of how we can make our, our uh, learners aware of these, being able to address them, to think them through, how they're interrelated and so on, to prepare them for the world of work. We need to look at the, at the opportunities that are there for educators uh, currently as well. We've realized that change is inevitable. We are not going to go back to the old normal. No, I, 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 can't, I can't see that. Not that the old normal was that great. We had great inequities in our teaching and uh, graduation outcomes and so on, but I, I won't go there in this limited time that I have. There's a willingness, I think, on the part of society in general uh, to break from you know, parents saying, well, it was good enough when I went to school, or this is what school really should be, et cetera, to, to open and, and the restart of education into something better. So the possibility of serious change is, is good. We see the... Uh, the, uh, the whole thing about planning and, and scenario planning. Well, if we did this, what should happen? What if we do that? How can we be prepared uh, for suddenly having to shut down school systems and send education home? How, how, what can we do for people? Because once students are out of school for any length of time, especially in the developing world, uh, those students could be lost forever because they will be swept into the world of work and uh, just by, by desperation and so on. So 
what does this mean then for, for teacher education? Well, <clears throat> as I say, what we need to do is, are we going to go back to normal and back to where we were, or do we want to actually build back better? And uh, how do we do this? How do we engage society so that we uh, uh, as educators can uh, have society backing, collaborating, working with us and, and uh, providing the resources? Uh, these are, are very, very important and especially for teacher education institutions, not only in pre-service, but in, in uh, in-service work that will need to be done. So there are a number of voices that are out there suggesting that in the new change, there are some th things that were missing in the old normal. And uh, I, I think it, here are, are a couple of, of them. One is, is uh, uh, Zul Razek uh, there at at the uh, International Islamic University of, of Malaysia, Kuala Lumpur. Zul is continually calling for a re-examination of values, the underpinnings of relationships and so on being, being uh, reconsidered. And if we look at the, the work of Satish Kumar from India, he feels that what we really need is to examine our whole relationship with the planet, the, the impact of, and so on of, of, uh, of how we see the world. You know, is it simply a big pot of natural resources for us to take uh, as, uh, as we wish? So this huge global challenge of how, how can we create an economy and social systems, et cetera, that enables individuals and, and communities to thrive equitably. Equitably is an important component, but at the same time, sustaining the capacity of the environment to, uh, to support uh, the world for future generations. So, the struggle to do this has been going on for, for quite some time. And the, uh, right at the end of the Second World War, we thought, OK, how can we come together to try and figure this out? And so we formed the United Nations. In 1987, though, we realized that simply putting a focus on environment wasn't working and that we needed to have some sort of balance and, and how could we address the abject poverty in so many of the former colonies that in the developing nations that were there and so, and so the idea was to balance development with environmental protection and so the concept of sustainable development was brought forward by 1992, uh, five years after the concept was adapted, a work program was brought forward called Agenda 21. And that lasted until the turn of the millennium, uh, both the turn of the century and, and uh, coming into 2000, we have the millennium development goals were brought in. In Agenda 21, we had roughly 40 chapters. In uh, the Millennium Development Goals, we had eight targets, but for developing countries. Now, from 2015 to 2030, the next 15 year period, we have something called the Sustainable Development Goals. So these are, are global ways of trying to address the progress and the development of the world. These 17 goals, I think probably you are all uh, well aware of, but they go all the way from, and, and the first one is addressing poverty, second is on hunger, third is health, and the fourth goal is quality education. Uh, if you look at the others, you will see uh, clean water, responsible consumption, and the last one is extremely important, it's the idea of partnerships because countries can't do this alone. It comes all the way down to states and provinces 
down to local communities and then different sectors of society. And one of the most important sectors within society is education. Now, the idea of Sustainable Development Goal 4 on quality education, it has seven targets that are there. And the first one being completely free quality primary and secondary school. Now, <clears throat> this is uh, a, a target by, uh, by 2030. The second one is on early childhood education and then affordable quality technical, vocational and tertiary education and so on. But 4.7 is a very interesting one and one that I would like to talk about because it is the title of, of your thought. How do we bring sustainability into education? And this is what is called for by the United Nations and all of the countries around the world. Knowledge and skill for sustainable development. Now, if we take that target and open it up even more, then you will see uh, target 4.7 by 2030, ensure all learners acquire knowledge and skills needed to promote sustainable development, including education for sustainable development and a little further global citizenship. Okay. So how do we bring that in? So the idea then is uh, we recognize, first of all, the United Nations General Assembly have these two aspects. One is the role of education for sustainable development to, in both uh, schooling and so on, but building public awareness, etc. But it also shows that in all of the 17 goals, we have a need for education, for public awareness, for public understanding, and so on. So it is not just in the classroom, but is building a knowledgeable society. And what is studied, especially as we get up higher in, in, the, uh, in the grades, then uh, we see the, uh, the need uh, for understanding of water issues and production issues and so on. How do we bring sustainability into manufacturing? So all of these are totally interrelated. So if we take any one issue, uh, for instance, let's take the issue of, of, of COVID. Right? You will see that there is a responsibility and a relationship between COVID and each of those 17 goals. Now we won't go into them in detail, but I, I just wanted to, to show the complexity, but at the heart of each one of these, of course, there is that education component. So what's what changed? Well, I, I suggest that the, the original stages of learning will remain, right? So we begin, as teachers and the earliest time that we begin by showing and enjoying learning, right? The joy of, of actually being there. And then moving on to the next step of exploring, well, what is there out there to learn? What, what, uh, what are the things that, that I can explore? And then the next step of learning how to acquire knowledge. You know, learn, learning to learn. Uh, where do you find things and how, uh, how do I, I uh, moving on from, uh, you know, uh, learning to read to reading to learn. These, these are wonderful steps. And then from there, where the student starts to develop their own intrigue, their own, what is it that I want to learn and learning with a purpose of, of, that they come up with that bo uh, blends into the next step of the student assuming responsibility for their own learning, for their own destiny. This is the heart of the last one of lifelong learning, of, of, of developing, beyond, uh, learning not only skills for the jobs and so on, but learning to, to be human exploring one's worldviews and so on. So we have that, that whole list. But education, I think while this is, is uh, 
these are the steps that will remain, we do see shift from the traditional foci. So the idea from, uh, of individual competence and individuality uh, to the common good. We, you know, if COVID has really brought us into, into examining the world of me and the world of we. You know, my, my rights, but also my responsibility to others, the wearing of a mask and so on. The idea of quality then, of going beyond excellence in mathematics and language to also quality including values, ethics and so on. The idea of uh, vocation, and training for 21st century skills for vocation, also includes the whole concept of well-being. And uh, there's more to life than simply the world of work. Equity issues around, that were largely around gender seem to move beyond that into one's whole identity. So equity is still a part and, and gender, but also sexuality and, and uh, a broader component. So, uh, and the idea of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics moving to include the, the arts and artificial intelligence. The idea of, of, uh, of reflection and learning uh, sort of to, uh, to, uh, to reflect and how to, how to make judgments. How, uh, how to sort out false news or false uh, 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 just ideas that uh, could, what could be, is that real? Could it be real? How do I check it? How do I, uh, how do I sort that out? So if we look at, at um, within UNESCO, in, in 1996, they came forward uh, with the idea of what is the purpose of education? So if they, and they came up with four big ideas, learning to know, learning to do, learning to be, to become all one can, and learning to live together and we say that these are kind of shifting now so that in, by, uh, uh, with the sustainable development goals that I just talked about, the impact of that is from learning to know is to be aware of the unknown. Uh, 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 there's so, so little that we actually know about the planet and how it works, for instance. And learning to do well, how to do it ethically okay. and learning to be, yeah, but that could be self-centered. We're trying to, to see how can you, you be, but at the same time ensure equity for others to be as well. And from learning to live together, we move on to learning to live together with others sustainably. Now, we, we talked about education for sustainable development in 4.7, but also the idea of a global citizenship. So what they're now saying is that we need to, to address, yes, the 21st century competencies that, are, that have been put out by OECD and, and so on, uh, but we need to, as I say, move beyond just gainful future employment. And how can we bring in the ideas that uh, of these other issues that, uh, that I, I mentioned? And so what are the implications in doing this uh, for, for students, for teachers, for education systems? Uh, if you're setting national examinations, which determine what really gets focused on, what gets taught, and so on, and what does it do for, for, uh, for teacher education institutions. So as we're moving 
pardon me, uh, you know, touching the controls here. Um, as we think about these changes, UNESCO has also said, look, in 1996, with the Dolores report, that was then. What is now? And so UNESCO is reaching out, trying to figure out uh, it, uh, what should education look like post COVID, but it, it, even before COVID, they started into this. Uh, you know, uh, uh, the wonderful quote from the, the Director General of, of UNESCO when she says, when inequalities deepen, when digital big data and artificial intelligence open new perspectives, when cognitive sciences disrupt traditional approaches to learning, then it is crucial to rethink education. And the futures of education, I strongly urge you, especially those of you on the faculty there at Cebu Normal, to go to the UNESCO website and become engaged with the uh, futures of, uh, of education. It's, uh, it is uh, uh, open, if students can engage, can send in their ideas and so on as to what should it look like. So if we look at the, uh, the idea of, one of the ideas at any rate that was putting forward was regarding sustainability, was to think of it as a purpose of education. So that it would be embedded in all of the different disciplines right? and, and, and at sort of all grade levels. Now, let me move on to Cebu Normal itself and the whole idea of education and sustainability. And so let's start with a traditional look at the purposes of higher education, the three big ones, teaching, research, and, uh, and um, community service. So if we look at teaching and teaching and learning, how do we embed into the curriculum? How do we bring sustainability into all of the different grades and subjects and so on? In much the same way as we look at racism or equity and so on, as a way of, of trying to embed it into the very culture of the school. If we look at the um, at, uh, in learning, for instance, uh, transparent assessment mechanisms, uh, you know, how, how can we bring it in there? Uh, if we um, look at, the, at the, the teaching, again, we need to, to think of changing the, the, pro, uh, the approaches and uh, it's simply moving uh, from uh, transmission of knowledge into much more into the way of critical thinking and so on. If we think of learning strategies, how do we move from that transmissive and just handing out information, which is an important foundation, but we can't stop there, right? We can, so then we start building into other activities and then actually looking at transformative learning strategies. So all of this, is a, a way of preparing people for a, 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 a world in the future, a world of change. Now, we can still do this, but tie it in to our, um, our ongoing strategy. It doesn't mean throwing everything out and so on, starting over. No, it is much more one of adaptation thoughtful adaptation and building on one's own strengths as a professor or you as a student teacher, building on your particular strengths. So if we think of uh, education theory that is solid all around the world, the work of Bloom, right? And, uh, so Bloom came up with six different levels of, of stages of, of learning and, and of, uh, of, um, of competence. So the first three were largely learning as acquisition. Two plus two equals four, learning the boiling point of water, learning uh, uh, various things that are true, false, etc. Getting that 
good firm base down there. And then moving from there in, in analyzing and, and looking at things and, uh, and then finally moving up to a stage five and six where you are actually putting things together, you are synthesizing, you're, uh, you are becoming engaged in working with and, and seeking things that you, you really, um, um, that weren't clear in creating new knowledge. Now, if we look at it from a chart point of view, what uh, if we look at the idea of building resilience and, and understanding sustainability in new and, and especially in new and emerging issues. Now within sustainability, you have issues that have, are ongoing and you can find research and knowledge in it. Right? But then you have other issues that are suddenly upon us that we don't know that much about. So if, for instance, at one point, we uh, climate change, is it real? Is it not? What is causing it? What could it do, et cetera? Now we are much more into that and we can learn about it. COVID-19 is a classic example of a, of a wicked issue like climate change was, right? It is one of those issues where we really do not know that much about it and, and understand the transmission and so on. So if we look at this chart, you will see the, uh, along the vertical axis, whether or not we can actually measure and assess and so on. And then across the bottom is the certainty of what it is that we're teaching. Okay. So very high certainty. Two plus two equals four. Okay. We can measure it very high. And so this first is blooms one, two, and three, that, that area. And this is where most school systems get stuck. This is where, where we stay. But if we start to move out into bloom four and then five and six, as we get out where we, there really is this great uncertainty. This is the emerging world. This is the world out here where those issues are going to come in this post COVID-19 world. But we need to learn to be comfortable in teaching out there. How do we measure? How do we assess? How do, how do, we, uh, how do we actually cope with these kinds of things? So, Part of dealing, for instance, out in this un unknown air would include questioning our worldviews, learning other worldviews. For instance, the world of, of um, indigenous people, their relationship to the world, to the land and the water and the resources and so on. One of my colleagues, Dan Longboat, is uh, he's a, a Haudenosaunee elder here in, in Canada. And he, he loves to build on the ancient Chinese uh, proverb about feed a man a fish and you feed him for a day, teach him how to fish though and you feed him for his lifetime. And, uh, but Dan's uh, take is teach human beings their sacred relationship with fish and you will have human beings and fish until the end of time. So I think with secondary school students exploring those, uh, those kinds of, of uh, so that's all in teaching and learning. But if we want to move on then to research that, that other huge role, the idea of research with a purpose, building in values and ethics in, into research, the idea of uh, aligning work with biomimicry, that, uh, you know, the two Japanese super cranes, the one on the left, the pink one, it was designed for very high speed travel out in the open. So that nose uh, of it was specially designed. The train, the gray one, was a high speed train as well, but its front nose was designed on a along the lines of uh, the duck-billed platypus. This is a, a small mammal in Australia. 
that goes through very shallow streams without making an, any wave or wake. So the purpose of this train is going through tunnels. And so on those runs that have a lot of mountains in Japan, this would be the desired uh, face on the front of it. So that's the, the, uh, the idea of, of, of uh, working in, in bringing sustainability into research in the future. And the third one of being community service, the idea of, of youth engagement, uh, modeling sustainability as the institution itself, not only greening the campus to, to save money and so on, but using the research and the modeling and, and sort of being out there to support and to help the community. Um, using your credibility and your knowledge to help the community that is around you and to improve their lot in life and, and, and to be a, a support with them. I know in Cebu, you have the, the United Nations University, the Institute for Advanced Studies and Sustainability. You have your members of the Regional Center of Expertise in, in ESD. And so this kind of role of the university working with the, uh, with the community is so important. Engaging this, the, the community as, as uh, uh, citizen scientists. And so they capture data and so on, bring it in, and then using their collective data uh, to, uh, uh, to even have the students in the schools in that community analyze the data, build graphs, and, 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 and teach math, and so on. So those are the, the kinds of, of, uh, of issues of, of the community service. And then importantly, the idea of not indoctrination, no, education but giving young people the skills of becoming citizens, right? of trying to help them. How do you, how do you, uh, uh, how do you lobby? How do, uh, what are the effective ways of bringing about uh, um, uh, changes in society? Looking into sociology, psychology, and so on. What can we do to actually bring about these kinds of changes. So all of these collectively, we, we think of as institutions doing a whole institution approach. The idea of bringing together the stakeholders, the, the people in admin and leadership, the faculty, the students themselves, the learners, to come up with a plan or a vision of how to bring sustainability into the institution. Uh, to get the technical and also the financial support, sometimes by uh, through all of the energy savings of water, waste uh, management and so on, provides a stream for funding other changes within the institution. But it's important not to stop at just greening the campus. The whole idea is greening the minds as well. Okay. And then using uh, networks to, to move forward. So by embedding sustainability across the campus in the research and the teaching and learning, working in the community and actually embedding it right into the whole culture, the mission, the vision, the policy, even hiring practices and so on in the institution is what we're, what we're talking about in a post COVID world. Here's a, a very briefly a schematic as I'm closing. Uh, the idea of the whole school approach being at, at the center in here, and then the, the different components, the faculties, the community or governance schemes, the curriculum, what gets taught, and, and also the sort of the culture, the research, those cylinders that I just showed you in working in here and then developing a strategy to, uh, to move forward, building the commitment on the part of, of everyone, including any unions and so on to, to be there. 
and then developing the protests, uh, process and, of course, the monitoring, setting targets, moving forward, uh, letting people know, celebrating, and so on. So that's the the uh, 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 and uh, uh, the idea of engaging the other sort of external uh, partners, including the government and school uh, uh, external, whether it's a board of regents or governors or whatever, and then all together the idea of collaboratively learning. So that's. Uh, the idea of moving forward in in the uh, not only in dealing with COVID, but moving forward in this idea of continuous improvement in a whole institution approach. Now, <clears throat> I think all of you are aware of the idea of the ecological footprint. It is the the impact that each of us make as we live our lives. It, it's an idea that came from um, a professor at um, University of British Columbia. It is spread and has grown and so on. But there is the other side, that hopeful side. When a little girl in grade four in India said, when she was being taught about her ecological footprint. And she said, but I have hands. I can do something about them. And so the whole concept of the ecological handprint being the positive side of what we can do as we move forward. This idea has uh, gathered. You'll find it on the internet. You will find uh, it is spread not only in India, but through a large part of Asia. It is spread into Africa and into North America. Uh, but the only reason that it spread was because the little girl told her teacher. The teacher was wise enough to understand the power of the imagery. The teacher went to a large non-government organization in India, the Center for Environmental Education. They took the idea, they built upon it, and they took the idea to the government, to the Ministry of, of Natural, of Environment, rather, in India. And it stuck and it grew. It wouldn't have gone anywhere. We, we all have little children in, in, in early grades put their hand on the paper, draw around it, paint it, etc. It was the vision of that young teacher who saw something in it. It was the collaboration of the non-government organization, the willingness of the government to work with the NGO. And so that idea of partnership Partnerships will be so important in a post-COVID world, a world we can't really see, but one that is coming. I hope you find these remarks uh, uh, useful in your, th in, uh, in your thinking. I've included here a number of useful resources that uh, I'm sure we will figure out a, a way of, of, uh, uh, of sharing with you. And uh, I thank you very, very much for this opportunity to be with you. Thank you.